Uzuzankwala, I'm Sonam Dima. Southeast Asian countries are said to be most vulnerable when it comes to climate change. To discuss more on this, we have with us three experts from India, Bhutan and Nepal. Karma Sring from National Environment Commission, Dr. Binod Dawadi from Central Department of Hydrology and Metrology, Dipayan Dey from South Asian Forum for Environment. Climate change has become one of the most highlighted global concerns. How real is climate change? See, climate change uh, is a buzzword though, but whether it is real or unreal from the scientific reasons, that is a separate issue. But think about the common people, they're seeing the change in the pattern of rainfall, in the pattern of snowfall, drought, flood. So these external and extreme events are telling upon the livelihood. So I think when it comes to the livelihood and the life, definitely it becomes a real scenario for men. And if you study the, uh, say, the, the span of 10 years, there's a radical change. So whether this is climate change or not is a separate debate. But for the commons, these changes are affecting us. This is affecting our livelihood, our health. That is a big concern. And definitely it's a global concern. So I think in that way, it's very real before us. Of course, the climate itself, not the constant phenomenon, not the extension, it's changing here and there, and with respect to time, it's changing. But what I totally agree with him is, now in the, in the recent decades, the changing is in the alarming rate. And what yes, the people are ex facing is, or oh, they have experienced, is changing. But the issue is that, how was the climate in the past? And Correct. what is the degree of the change? That is the different things, but we totally agree with that. It's changing. Right. But Maybe if I also supplement to what Mr. Tipian said, uh, maybe from the layman's perspective also. Mm -hmm. Of course, so many scientists have really come up that climate change is really happening. But if you look from very layman's point of view also, uh, taking a very simple example like in Bhutan, uh, we have a place like Boomtown, yeah. where we don't grow rice before. Uh -huh. But now, a few years back, they did an experiment and now rice is being grown. Mm -hmm. So, right. usually the rice grows at a lower altitude. Mm -hmm. That means like the warming is happening. So, exactly. So, I think these are some of the, the things that... It's I very evident. I mean, evident. People, can, so people can easily understand that there is a change yeah. which was not there before. Yeah, no, no, no. So, this new thing is what people can assume as climate change, definitely it is there. And uh, studies and I think experts have been saying that South Asian countries are most vulnerable when it comes to climate change. So yeah. how vulnerable are countries like ours? Uh, see, my perspective is uh, definitely uh, climate change has got two aspects. One is the economic aspect that tells on the livelihood. Another is the risk and the vulnerability. So South Asia, all the countries are developing countries. We have a weaker economy. We are trying to develop. So if the hit comes on that, naturally it is affecting us. On the second part, when we talk about the, uh, say, environmental hazards, the risks, that is also very alarming because it is geographically located in such a position that the extremities are very sharp, like the coastal belts, or the, uh, say, uh, hilltop mountains. For example, Bhutan. Bhutan is on the eastern Himalayas, which is the, which is a young mountain. So random and radical changes are happening. So once climate change comes into action, so all these changes are multiplied. So naturally, we become very vulnerable. And we do not have a supporting economy like the first world countries to resiliate against this type of a situation. I think, uh, especially from the Bhutan, or maybe within our own region, perspective, uh, one one of the major economies, our economics are basically agrarian. Yeah. We are highly dependent on agriculture. agriculture yes. uh, uh, from that perspective, uh, agriculture is highly dependent on water. And so those are the sectors which are very much highly vulnerable to okay. climate change. And uh, another thing that, as D Mr. Dipayan mentioned, we are developing or poor countries. We do not have 
those expertise or forget about the expertise, even the financial things for us to adapt or right. to the resist. technology deficiencies also. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why most of our sectors are highly vulnerable. But specifically speaking from Bhutan's perspective, I think agriculture sector and water sector is the most vulnerable sector for us. And this is also a high, a high concern for us because our economy is dependent on agriculture, our economy is dependent on hydropower for instance for Bhutan. So we have to be very, very uh, much uh, concerned about this yes. issue. Uh, in this regards, I have a little different views. Because to identify the vulnerable or the, our own capacity, the, we, means the India or some parts of India, basically Nepal and Bhutan, we have the meteorological data history is very short, which is the indicator for the climate change. Either there is change or not. To decide, we need the meteorological data. And the problem is that we have very short meteorological data. And with that short meteorological data, it's a little difficult to say what is the impact of that. Either is the real impact of the climatic change that makes our region more vulnerable or not. For example, in the Indian case, northern Western India have more than 100 years data. Mm -hmm. Even Sikkim is having more than 100 years long data, in instrumental data. But in the case of Nepal, I think this uh, just around 40 years right now. And almost all the station lies in the valley bottom. Yeah. Okay. And all the vulnerable area, like people said the mountain ecosystem, glacier, they all lies in the high altitudes. Mm -hmm. And data from lower altitudes cannot represent well to the high altitudes. And yeah. Yeah. other Western yeah, countries, there, yes. developing developed countries is having the different data sets, reanalysis data, satellite data and also models in the areas like us where there is large variation in the topographical gradients within a short distance yeah cannot this, this becomes well, a little difficult yes. cannot work very well such a models and ourselves we are not able to produce such a models that is fit in our region so it's of course the climate change is there and it makes affecting the life it's real but what i want to share is the degree of vulnerability is maybe not exactly like what the developed country is saying mm -hmm. because due to that we know they also change the uh, saying of the ipcc report also they said by 2040 2040 no Himalayas, no snow in the Himalayas. No, I but think I think these are a little bit panicky for yeah. the commons. So but uh, I just want to come down to very basic things mm -hmm. for the commons. Say, for example, mm -hmm. Paro. Uh, last year I was here in November, okay. and believe me, this river, the edges were frozen. Mm -hmm. In November we had that type of a low temperature. I'm not saying that this is climate mm -hmm. change, <laughs> but I'm saying that these changes or fluctuations, it is an uncertainty. For a farmer, this is an uncertainty. For a common man, it's an uncertainty. So that makes the common man very vulnerable. Yes. And we do not have pre-information that this will happen or this will not happen. Say glacial lake outburst flood. We do not have early uh, warning system everywhere. Maybe few people are getting the alerts. So these are few areas where we have technology deficiency, what Karma uh, I mean, very nicely said. This technology deficiency is just because of the economic vulnerability. And once that is supported, when, when we say it is a global concern, yeah. now who else in, uh, in the world keeps a 72.5% forest? You tell me that. So we should get leverage for that. Like Bhutan should get the leverage for keeping this forest, forest alive. Yes. But that type of an equitable sharing is not yeah, happening exactly. in the economy. So that is making us more vulnerable. One of the scientists uh, was mentioning yesterday that uh, the rise in temperature yeah. affects the production of milk uh, from live, livestock, uh, for example, cow. So how, how does climate change affect food security? The National Environment Commission Secretariat in, in consultation and collaboration with other relevant sectors also, we have done some study, studies, uh, assessments 
the Ministry of Agriculture also recently conducted uh, the assessment of crop vulnerability, how the crops are being impacted, whether climate change or whatever seasonal change. So we really foresaw quite a lot of uh, dramatic changes. Uh, earlier I was also mentioning about the, the rice, you know, like rice being now grown in Bundang. One way it is good, but other way is a concern because uh, if those things goes up, higher up, we do not have similar valleys like in Paro or you mm. know, other places. We have very limited things. And then on the crop itself, several other crops patterns has changed. The production, some are really going up, some are really, you know, is failure kind of crop patterns. So this is something which we really feel that it is definitely something that has got to do with this uh, climate change impacts or effects from those weather patterns. So, whatever it is, definitely we, I think we really have to look at a concrete kind of uh, research to see if it is really happening. So this is what we are also, I think the government and the sectors, private uh, NGOs, this is where, especially in our part of the world, this is what is, uh, what is being focused. because. Agriculture sector is the main sector for us, and and in this uh, three days workshop also we are also looking at the the issue from the impacts on the uh, crops from the climate change. Yes. And what are some of the measures that we can do to you know? So when we look at those things, definitely there's a impact. Uh, but we, to some extent, do not really have uh, concrete data to say this much production is hampered or this many production is being increased but definitely it is uh, happening and it is really a concern actually see another important thing is there there was a time when due to population growth we focused on uh, maximization of production so we brought in high yield varieties genetically modified uh, plants and all these are not climate resilient they're very subtle type of uh, plants now <clears throat> in this course we have lost the traditional varieties like tell me, uh, I do not know though, uh, in Bhutan, how many farmers religiously cultivate buckwheat? buckwheat? There, is a, there is a traditional type of a crop. Mm -hmm. We are getting in a lot of no, hybrids. In India also, in uh, say the delta areas, the salt resistant varieties, local varieties are all lost. So that has put us into a more uh, uh, I mean, steep situation for food security. Because we never thought that this climate change will happen. Though climate change is not a new phenomenon, it has happened multiple times on Earth, maybe a lot of, uh, uh, say, uh, ice ages we have seen, and we are just proceeding to another. So we should have been prepared for that, and we should have kept the traditional food in stock. So this is now the period where the government should also focus on the traditional farming, the traditional food, the traditional crops, and try to find out more of climate resilient food crop. So that is very important for us. I totally agree with both. Since Nepal, in fact of the climate change in agriculture is the most vulnerable because most of the people depend on the agriculture sector and the agriculture sector due to the poor irrigation system, rain fed economy. And mainly if no rain in time, agriculture productivity less. And basically in the high altitudes, what the people are finding is the taste of apple. Also the not taste as earlier. Mm, okay. mm. And for the buckwheat or wheat, if there is the snowfall in time, they will get the source of precipitation and mm. they can grow. Due to this changing, they have do not have the There's a fall in production and fall in yeah, production. Yeah, that's they do not get the snow getting affected. Yes. And maybe the moisture getting less, that's why the taste of the food or fields that right. is grown in the high altitudes also getting different. Not the good taste as earlier. So it's the in the high altitudes and as in the lower altitudes we have the same kind of the problem. Problems is good. Same in the Pro agriculture problem, I think uh, I think uh, most of the people in Bhutan, for example, this year itself, mm -hmm. uh, when we had a very erratic, heavy, you know, extreme weather, mm -hmm. even in terms of rainfall, you know, like our farmers uh, were taken by surprise. Uh -huh. uh, so they lost quite a lot of rice in the plantation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They harvested before thinking that it is time, but then the rain 
Okay. It got delayed and it yeah. came mm. you know, suddenly. So, so these are the impacts, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And experts have warned that glaciers in the Himalayas are melting at an alarming rate. So, uh, could you elaborate on this? Yeah, I have a small experience of working in the glacial lake outburst flood in Bhutan. Uh, as you know, I have uh, served Shebsi College for almost around 10 years. And we had a small project uh, in, in, in our department where we wanted to see the position of the glacial lakes with using uh, satellite imageries and what is the risk behind that. So ultimately it came out that uh, it was somewhat uh, like uh, we are sitting on the time bombs. So it is really very risky in that way. And lot of such flood events have happened in Nepal, in, in Bhutan also, in uh, say northeastern part of India also. Uh, so it is devastating and it is, uh, say, uh, a very, very, uh, say, a critical situation for the common men. But you know how climate change is linked with this? This was there. This was also there beforehand. But how climate change is linked with this is the glacial retreats and the huge amount of water is being dumped in the glacial lakes. Now the glacial lake wall is a moraine dam which is very weak. So if the water volume increases, there is every risk that it breaks the wall and comes down as, as a as a flash flood. So in Uttarakhand also, you must be knowing, we had a terrible flood. Everything was washed off. Such type of events are now considered as, uh, say, external or say extreme events, which are getting more triggered with uh, climate change impacts. I think we need to develop some sort of an early alert warning system. And community preparedness is very important because already we have traditional knowledge of it. So if, if the communities are prepared, uh, definitely that will help us to uh, rescue. Maybe in Nepal you have uh, yes. similar? Yes, of course. This, the issues of the glacier lake outburst or expansion of the glacier is the major concern all over the Himalayan region. And in the case of Nepal, also it's the increasing rate is very high. For example, we can take the Choropa Glacier Lake. Yeah. In 1965, this area was just 0.25 km square kilometer. But when it comes into 1999, 1.65 square kilometer. And several gla glacier lake was outburst. But there are, is some good practice that that lakes now use some techniques to drain out that water mm -hmm. in the control rate. And by that water in the downstream, they generate the electricity. Yeah, this is, I mean, the disadvantage has to be converted yes. into advantage. And local people in the high altitudes getting the electricity and keep the lake level constant or even down. Yes. And also they have the early warning system. Right. So I think we need to share this kind of good practice in our region. What is happening in this region, we need to... Correct. Can duplicate in other regions because the topography and the problem and everything we have the same things to share. See another important thing is uh, geographical information system and remote sensing has developed quite a lot mm. and you can get the location of the legs uh, very much in the internet mm. like if you uh, come into the IC mode uh, say website yes. they have a complete plan for Bhutan. Mm land use land pattern and you can find out the lakes where where it is or how it is so in that particular georg or in that particular zunkhag there can be special uh, say protection measures taken and that can be resilient like the the nepal incidents as, as he said it can be converted into an advantage it's a source of water yeah. basically so that we need to develop yeah i think uh, in bhutan I, I, I do not want to mention mm -hmm. about the potential danger of the uh, glacier since two of you already mentioned it is highly dangerous mm -hmm. for us and the impact is tremendous yeah. you know it will have impact since due to uh, you know the the location of the lake at a very high altitude and the, the water is rapid mm -hmm. you know the impact will be very much but I wanted to stress the importance of uh, glaciers you know uh, on one hand if the glacier is melting of course, we are getting water, mm -hmm. but at the same time, when the water gets emptied, mm -hmm. then our water is an issue. Yes. And for a yes, country correct. like Bhutan, where we are depending to some extent, uh, some of our major hydropower mm -hmm. projects are dependent on this. Uh, yes, that's a very pertinent issue. So, very important. 
But at the same time, we have also with the support from the JEF and other donor agencies, mm. some of our glacier lakes, we have done some kind of uh, adaptation mm. programs. Wow. Okay. Mm. And also the early warning system mm. has now been installed in mm. some of these potentially dangerous mm. lake right. routes. Mm. So, but there are quite a lot of other lakes mm. which is also there. So, But if we do not really uh, take care of those glaciers or glacier mm -hmm. lakes mm -hmm. I think then it would be a huge problem at, at one point of time and as I was saying when we talk about the vulnerable thing also I think that's another vulnerable thing you know, yes, we do not have the adaptation measures yeah. or if something happens uh, there is no measure at mm -hmm. all for us to you know resist or save people's mm -hmm. life or properties that's true. so I think that, that is the, uh, the true context and it is said that uh, climate change is global, but uh, adaptation is local. So uh, how can South Asian countries uh, work together at a platform like this, like the workshop, uh, the current ongoing workshop uh, facilitated by APN, Asia Pacific Network? So how yes, can uh, these countries work together? See, this is why we are all here, Asia Pacific Network. We are really I mean, uh, thankful to them that they organize this. We have local problems which are triggered by the global climate change patterns. So we will have to find out local solutions. As uh, rightly said by, uh, by our expert, that what happens in Nepal or the climatic information that we have in Nepal may not be correct for South India. Or what is present in South India may not be correct for Bhutan. So place-based solutions are very important. And as we said that our economy is developing, we do not have that much of a technology. So collaboration is important. So we can resiliate among ourselves and collaborate to that. So Asia Pacific Network is basically uh, working towards that. And we are uh, in these two days of workshop, we try to identify what are the major areas. Like one, as uh, 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 Karma had rightly said, water is a major area, water resource. Then climate information is a major area. Agriculture and biodiversity is a major area. So we are trying to find out that what problems can be identified and how we can engage the young scientists into this and how we can have a regional collaboration. So that will help us uh, to resilient within the region. And I think we, we are in the right track after the two days of work. I, I must acknowledge the, of course, uh, the support and the facilities uh, and the sponsorship of this particular event uh, by APN. Uh, APN has like about 22 member countries, uh, including countries and uh, institutes. Uh, so as Mr. Dipian was saying, I think the collaboration, collaborative effort is, I think, one of the, the best solution. That's what we feel. Uh, I think at individual level, countries are trying their best, uh, but it is becoming a little bit isolated. Uh, the climate change issue is very much global, as Mr. Tipen again said. Uh, forget about global issue, but it's a huge impact within the region. In the region. And lots of the regions has quite a lot of expertise within the countries, but it is, it has been remaining within their own countries. But with through such collaboration, we are we know where the expertise are, and what kind of expertise. Through that kind of uh, collaboration, we are able to you know, collaborate and then work together and then solve the local issues. Yeah, I, I totally know. agree with the, my two colleagues. In the case of the issues like climate, it's saying they think globally, collaborate regionally, I do locally. That gives you the real scenario because it's affecting one place to one another place. So we need to have the local global ideas, what is the things going on. But that may not be equally important for our region. That's why we need to have such a program or such a common thematic area to work in such an issue in the regional scale. Like this APM is focusing the South Asia. Yes. Because we had the, somehow the same common issues that what issue other European countries is different than our. Correct. That's why we need to start the work in locally. The, yeah, that is, that is very important. Just I wanted to say that that's, uh, the good news is uh, we have already uh, implemented one project which is under the support of APN. Mm -hmm. And uh, India, Bhutan and Philippines mm -hmm. is, is collaborating on that. 
The project is being, uh, I mean, implemented here by South Asian Forum for Environment, SAFE. Uh, it's about engaging the agricultural wastes for increasing the soil potential, not burning it because burning causes emission and agricultural waste burning can lead to forest fire. So we are trying to prevent that and the same debris or the same agricultural waste is converted into organic manures or for use for mulching and that can increase the soil potential. So this type of very small ground zero projects, if you can bring in, and if the young scientists from Bhutan, the young students can bring it into the community level, I think that's a, that's a wonderful scope that we have. See, a lot of resources are there in the region. Few examples I'd just like to cite, like Shark Development Fund or Indo-Bhutan Trust Fund. These are resources where we can engage the young scientists, the entrepreneurs, the community leaders, and then they can come out with a lot of, you know, uh, uh, say, pilot programs. Uh, we are also, from SAFE, we are also collaborating with uh, Renew. Renew. Re Renew is a very uh, f famous uh, organization Renew. here. And we have proposed uh, to uh, uh, this SDF, SAG Development Fund, that integrated solid waste management is very important now. Like, a lot of urbanization is happening. So where this solid waste is going? how that solid waste can be converted into a resource and that can help the common people to earn money. So this type of a thing is a climate adaptive step and definitely if small steps but constantly, consistently if we take these steps, we can, we can in the region we can develop that uh, strength to resilience. This was a very enriching conversation. Thank you very much for your time Thank and you. sharing your insight Thank with you. us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.